All right, what's up everybody? Welcome back to another album review. The first album review I've done on this channel in probably six months, so it's been long overdue, but I've kind of been in the mood for one again. And specifically for today's video, I'm gonna be talking about a band, an album that has such a deep connection to my musical and personal upbringing that I feel like it's only fair of me to, to finally give it some attention on this channel. And some of you guys have been requesting it for a couple months, so. Without any further ado, today we're talking about the debut album by one of the greatest bands of all time, Pink Floyd, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, released on August 4th, 1967. Uh, what I have here is, I think it's a 2018, yeah, 2018 uh, mono reissue. So, um, unlike a lot of the more modern reissues of this album on vinyl and CD and the one that you find on streaming, this is the original mono mix which I'll get into the differences um, later on into the review, but basically all I need to say is Pink Floyd was a band formed in 1963, 4, 5, one of those years, under a multitude of different names. They're called like the T-Set, the Megadeths, the Pink Floyd Sound, uh, eventually the Pink Floyd, and then when this album came out, just Pink Floyd. Um, and the original lineup, as you can see right here on the back, was Sid Barrett, Roger Waters, Richard Wright, and Nick Mason. So yeah, before David Gilmore, um, and at this time, Sid Barrett um, was their guy. He was their original songwriter, frontman, lead vocalist, lead guitarist, pretty much the visionary who, um, I mean, he didn't form the band, but he, he is the one who was the architect of their sound the first couple of years. And when you think back on Pink Floyd and the legacy they made, you know, it's easy to look at The Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, Animals, The Wall, you know, their golden years with, you know, David Gilmour, Roger Waters, Richard Wright, Nick Mason, after Sid Barrett had left the fold. But none of those albums and none of those songs would have been made possible or even existed without this man right here, Sid Barrett, or Roger Barrett, but he eventually changed his name to Sid. Um, and to me, this is probably the pinnacle of 1960s psychedelic music. I think it just encompasses all the different elements of that whole scene, that whole revolution, into one just brilliantly executed, diverse record. And in order to get into the backstory of this, this specific album, you have to go back to the beginning of the Pink Floyd, obviously. So the band started their roots in the underground blues sing, skiffle, I mean it wasn't really skiffle, the Beatles were more skiffle, they were, they, rock had been well established by this point, but they were playing, you know, more underground rock blues shows, um, with Sid Barrett obviously as the guitarist, um, they had a couple other members then too, but the band really got their start in the clubs at that time, and they started just building up their skill, getting better, more rehearsed, started catching more eyes of, you know, people in the public, more people in the record business, record industry and everything started to take notice of them. And what I could say is, if you've heard some of their original early recordings, very cool stuff, very original stuff, but it definitely was just a continuation and expansion of the, you know, 50s and 60s blues scene that, you know, was popular in England and around the world at the time. But once the psychedelic movement started to take place in around 1964, 1965, when LSD and other psychedelics and, I mean, it was mainly LSD, but other drugs, really. Once a drug culture started to take over, the hippie culture started to become a popular thing. Uh, the Pink Floyd were, you know, not unaware of that. And specifically Sid Barrett, uh, he was the one who really, really took note of that whole culture and started to apply it to their music. So, in 1966, throughout that whole year, they started to add more improvisational jams to their sets um, just more weirdo, you know, things to their live set with lights and the stage show they started adding on to. So really by the end of that year, 1966, they were probably the most notorious band in the British underground scene at the time. Even probably more than the, the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, because the Beatles had already retired by that point from touring. Uh, the Rolling Stones, I mean, obviously they were huge, but they weren't really doing psychedelic music. I feel like they were always behind the curve. Uh, the Pink Floyd at the time were really doing something original and unique and I don't remember the exact dates But I do know that there was a couple of specific gigs in their history where they were playing shows and got noticed by some people and were like holy shit Who are these dudes? So Eventually they signed to uh, I think it was I don't know if it was Columbia EMI records EMI studios I think is where they recorded it, 
but maybe they're on Columbia Records. I'm not too familiar with all the record businesses and things of that time, uh, mainly Beach Boys and Beatles, but at least with Pink Floyd, um, they were signed in, I think, late 66, early 67, and we're like, all right, guys, you guys got something unique. So their first single, Arnold Lane, was released earlier in 1967. It was about some, like, cross-dresser who stole women's clothes. It was a crazy-ass song. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't included on this album, but uh, charted, I think, at, like, number something. I don't even remember, but it charted pretty high for their first single. Maybe number 20 or something like that. And really gave the Pink Floyd their first hints of major uh, big-time success. And it's really influenced the whole group to take things to an even further level. So I don't actually own that single, but it was uh, Arnold Lane as the A-side, Candy and a Current Bun as the B-side, which is another really cool song. Um, again, written by Sid Barrett. And hold on, the music stopped. Where'd it go? I don't know, we're gonna have no music for a little bit because it decided to turn off, so I don't know why that happened. But anyway, um, that single basically gave Columbia Records and the band uh, confidence in their sound and what they're doing. So eventually later on, they started doing more live shows at like, the UFO Club in London. I think it was in London, I don't remember. Um, and some other shows and things like that. So if you go on YouTube and look at Pink Floyd 1967, you can kind of take a look at what they were doing at the time. And it cultivated in probably the most iconic single of the Sid Barrett era, um, See Emily Play, backed by Scarecrow, which I think was released not too long before this. And they played it on top of the Pops, um, and it really was like their breakout hit, which was uh, charted at number six. And if you have not heard it, it is fucking brilliant. See Emily Play is like a blend of early Beatles with whimsical folk, with psychedelia, <coughs> with just the mixture of Sid Barrett's absolutely one-of-a-kind, unique artistic vision. And I think what... Oh, there we go. Give me just one second. I'm going to restart my phone and get the music back playing. But I guess what I mean to say is that when people think of the Pink Floyd... Not the Pink Floyd, but when people think of Pink Floyd, think of their sound. You know, you really tend to think of their later works, the more ambitious, conceptual albums with longer run times, more world themes. Um, you know, you think of the guitar work of David Gilmour, you think of the more slower, softer, dismal, darker sound of their later shit. But when it comes to their early work, Piper in specific, the sound they achieved on here and with CM Lee play Arnold Lane, their first couple singles, is completely different. And I think why their early stuff seems to be so controversial among music fans, Pink Floyd fans in general, is because of the drastic change in sound they made from this work to their later stuff. But I think it's very important not to forget... Oh, there we go, music's back. Sorry about that. It's very important not to forget where they started from. And as I said earlier, Sid Barrett was the visionary, the songwriter, the guy who, he was the Pink Floyd in the beginning. I mean, obviously you have to give credit to the rest of the members for filling out the sound and, and providing that background to give Sid Barrett his platform. But Sid was definitely a much more artistic, um, creative, intelligent, and unique individual than the rest of them. Um, he definitely had an idea for what he wanted the band to do. And... I think initially, you know, it was the blues stuff, but as the single started coming around, he started, you know, writing more pop stuff. And from what I've read in interviews, from what I've heard over the years, he wasn't really too big of a fan of going in the, you know, three, two, three minute pop direction that they were going in. He was really more into their long ass jams, improvis improvisational, psychedelic, crazy freakouts, which is kind of where Pink Floyd got their huge long songs from. So if you think of like Echoes, Shine On You Crazy Diamond, um, pigs, dogs, whatever, those really long songs, all those wouldn't have had the influence to exist without the live setting and live songs that Sid Barrett really conceptualized. And if you look on the back of the record right here, um, you can kind of notice that pretty much 90% of the music on this album was written by Sid Barrett. You had one song written by Roger Waters and then two jams that was composed by the whole band, but... This was really Sid Barrett's um, vision. This was his fullest vision I think he ever realized in his career, in his music, short, very short musical career. I mean, he really was only in the music business for 
less than 10 years from about 1965 to 1974 before he just completely abandoned it he just left and there's so many rumors of him being you know a recluse lost his mind became crazy you know ruined himself with drugs and i don't know how much of that is true you know i've read read and watched a lot about the dude and especially from hearing his solo music i think it's pretty apparent that he was an oddball kind of guy and in my opinion, I just feel like the reason he left Pink Floyd and the reason he cast himself out was because I don't know if being in a multi-million dollar pop rock psychedelic band was his calling in life. Um, he was an artist. He was a very, very quirky, um, different kind of guy. And if you look at his paintings throughout his whole life, he never really abandoned painting. Um, and he was always doing artistic things, whether it was whimsical, childish kind of things, or art or whatever or just living a simple basic life um you know he was a guy that was very misunderstood and i'm not even sure that the band themselves or anybody for that matter besides sid barrett really understood what was going on in his head so you know in terms of his decline and the whole collapse of him being in pink floyd i guess all i can say is that this album is what you need to know about sid barrett's vision of pink floyd i think you know, the reason I'm reviewing this album alone and I don't plan on reviewing any of their later stuff is because this is my favorite Pink Floyd album far and away. Um, just because I feel like the sound they went for is so much more energetic, so much more exciting. I think they cram so many more ideas in these songs than they did later on. I'm not saying they didn't progress musically because I definitely think their later work is more mature, more advanced, more complex, and more um, realized. I mean, I definitely think they got better with time. But the style they came up with later on, especially like Dark Side of the Moon and stuff, is very dreary, slower, darker, more somber, um, and I guess less ambitious in the sense that they were trying to resonate with the biggest audience possible. I think on the Piper at the Gates of Dawn, they didn't really give a shit, and I think Sid didn't really care what people thought about him. I think he just did what his heart told him to do. And from the album cover straight up, which, let me see, um, you can see right here, actually. I won't even read it. But um, the you can see all the people who were involved with the cover. Sid Barrett actually did this back design right here, this drawing. And this image right here was taken actually through a prism. So that's what gave it its cool look. But anyway, to, to return back to what I was talking about, See Emily Play and the singles. Um, after See Emily Play was released, they did Top of the Pops and were gaining a huge, huge following um, in the UK. You know... They went in the studio around the same time, started working on this album, and this was also around the same time that Sid Barrett started to do more psychedelic drugs, LSD, um, Quaaludes, uh, Downers, Uppers, all this crazy shit, which definitely probably impacted him in a big way. I mean, I definitely think the drugs were contributing to his, his mental decline, but I don't know if they were completely the main reason. Um, but people do say that around the time they played Top of the Pops, um, while recording this album, Sid had a particularly bad experience with LSD on like a week-long acid trip, and his mind was kind of fucked up after that. And I think maybe part of the reason he started taking a step back from the band is he just didn't want this kind of lifestyle anymore, because, you know, touring all the time, writing all these pop songs... You know, going into the studio, being expected to do these live sets really takes a toll on you. But fortunately, um, Sid and the rest of the band were able to record and complete this album before he completely derailed himself from the group. And what came out is just a brilliant combination of beautiful psychedelic pop songs, whimsical folk songs, um, crazy psychedelic freakout jams, and uh, just a brilliant production. The production on this album is so one-of-a-kind unique. Um, and as I said, the album was initially recorded and conceptualized and realized in mono. So the copy, the music I actually have on the background is the stereo uh, remaster that's on streaming. So what you're hearing right now is actually, you know, the modern uh, revision of it. But this specific record right here, this copy, and then what originally the band envisioned was mono. So... Personally, I prefer the mono mix just because they have more organ overdubs, more guitar overdubs. There's a lot of things in the stereo mix missing that they had in the original mono mix that added to the psychedelic layers, layers that added to the flair of the record, that added to the whole aura and atmosphere. So, 
Personally, if you haven't heard this album, or you have, whatever, if you're gonna listen to one version, I just re recommend getting your hands on a copy of the original mono mix, whether it's a first press, or this reissue right here. Um, I just think it's essential to hearing the version of the album that the band heard and approved themselves. And now the stereo and the mono were released at the same time. Um, the stereo maybe sounds a little bit clearer, better, more powerful. But you just gotta have the full range of sounds in my opinion. So anyway, without further ado, me rambling about the backstory and shit like that. Um, the band eventually brought all the songs together. Um, actually was recorded in EMI Studios at the same time that the Beatles were recording Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And actually both bands, you know, visited each other's sessions. So I think you can hear the influence of Sgt. Pepper's on here as well as the influence of Sar uh, Piper at the Gates of Dawn on Sgt. Pepper's. Just a very, very ironic thing that two of the biggest bands of all time were making two of the most important albums of all time at the same exact time in the same studio. Really very cool shit. And personally, if I had to pick a favorite of the two, um, I do have Sgt. Pepper's on vinyl, which I may review someday. But I like this one more. I'm more of a psychedelic, uh, ambitious, crazy music kind of guy. I feel like Sgt. Pepper's, though it has a lot of those elements... Um, is a little more commercial and accessible, and I definitely appreciate it for what it is, but this shit is just wild, uh, off the chain, off the hook, whatever you call it. It's just no rules, just free experimentation. And I guess I just gotta get into the songs, because I'm wasting time here, but anyway. Song one, we start with probably the best song Pink Floyd ever did with Sid Barrett, Astronomy Domine. Um... Probably one of their best songs they ever made, period. Uh, from the radio talking intro to the building um, guitar and drums, just building up the dong, boom, bow, boom, bow, bow, the drum fills, the lime and limpid green, the second scene, the fights between the blues you once knew, floating down, the sound resounds around the icy waters underground. How the fuck does one write lyrics like that? One thing I will give Sid above the rest of Pink Floyd is they had no fucking shot against him as a visionary artist um even though i do think the band later on made more accessible catchy music what sid did as a songwriter and lyricist is so fucking unique one of a kind and ahead of its time that you can go to this album specifically and even if it's not your jam pink floyd never produced another song or record that sounded remotely like this or Astronomy Domine. So, I think it's the perfect album opener. It has all of the elements that define the name Pink Floyd. And when you hear those instruments coming in, you hear that, you know, almost punk intensity. That's, that's what I think of when I think of Pink Floyd. When I think of the name Pink Floyd, I don't think of Comfortably Numb or Money or Wish You Were Here. I mean, those are beautiful, amazing songs, but... Pink Floyd, man, you think of fucking Astronomy Dominate, psychedelic interstellar overdrive, you know? So I think Astronomy Dominate opens the album perfectly, was one of their best live songs they ever did. If you watch live performances at that time, you know, Sid Barrett with his crazy robes on, with the flashing lights going like this. Fucking wild stuff, wild stuff. I would have loved to see that, that band, you know, when Sid was still in it. Great vocals too, great uh, harmonies by the whole group. And I think, uh, what's his name, Richard Wright? Who does the piano and backup vocals i think his vocals on this album shine more than probably on any other pink floyd album ever maybe besides saucer full of secrets but i feel like he was really underutilized and i think from what i've heard him and roger waters had beef and they didn't really like each other so i think having sit in the band as the leader kind of brought the whole group together in a more um, collected and calm and uh strong way and following Astronomy Domine is another great Sid Barrett song called Lucifer Sam. A uh, fucking crazy song. It's about a, a cat who I don't even really know. I, I mean, I think there's a printed... I don't even know if I have the lyric sheet in here. But it starts with almost a surf rock guitar riff. Just super, like, early 60s vibe, but mixed in with that, you know, punky psychedelia, as I said. With uh, great vocals by Sid Barrett. And just... The production, the energy, the vision. It's so out of this world. It's so spacey. It's so out there. It just captures your attention uh, perfectly. And it's followed up by another beautiful track called Matilda Mother. Which the leads on this one are actually um, shared by Sid Barrett and Richard Wright. Richard Wright does the main lead. Uh, Sid Barrett does the kind of like childish 
more whiny vocals, and this one's beautiful. Um, really is a good mixture of calm, eerie, um, kind of scary vibes, and then the more upbeat, kind of childish vibes, and it really brings the Sid's division together into a really cool song. Followed by another really cool song called Flaming, a very cool pop song. Um, I've always really loved this one. It, it reminded me of just flying in an airplane in a, you know, cloudy sky. Um, beautiful production. The mono mix is so much better than the stereo mix. Just the vocal panning, the reverb, the chorus, the organs and shit. So fucking unique. Um, and following that up is a song called Power Talk H which is a freak out instrumental jam, the first of two instrumental jams on the album, actually more like three, um, I don't know, more like two, this one's fucking sick, uh, just their, the cool noise effects, Roger Waters with the screechy fucking monkey sounds, um, crazy shit, I can just imagine seeing this live and just being like, he never hearing music like this, and you watch them play that shit, very cool stuff. Definitely shows the um, less composed side of the band and more just the live side of the band, which is why I love this album, is they both represent their songwriting. Um, not only does it represent the band band sound, but it also represents Sid Barrett's songwriting voice as well as the band's live sound, which I think they captured really well. And some people do say, some people who saw them at the time and bought this album say that it didn't really capture the intensity of their live performances, but... You know, you can never really get a studio album to sound exactly like a live performance, and from what I've heard from their live performances, and comparing to this album, this shit is brilliant. And the last song on side one is Take Up Thy Stethoscope and Walk, the only original composition by Roger Waters, and actually a really cool song. Uh, very, very fast, upbeat, again, a very punky song. Um, I really like it. You know, I'm not the biggest Roger Waters fan, but I think this is a great song, a great effort by him. I like his vocals. The doctor, doctor, just strange. It's really wacky, weirdo shit. And it closes off side one very well. Very cool stuff. Side two opens up with probably the most iconic instrumental in Pink Floyd's entire catalog, Interstellar Overdrive, an 11 minute, absolutely fucking crazy song. And I'm gonna turn the volume up in the background a little bit so you can hear it. Oh, this is actually the song pr previous to that, but when Interstellar Overdrive comes on, you'll hear it. Interstellar Overdrive is what I imagine flying to space would be like. Um, starts with one of the coolest guitar riffs of the 60s, played by Sid. Um, really reminds me of Inagata De Vida by Iron Butterfly, but I personally like this song better. Um, you can hear it right now, actually. It's going to be playing in the background. There we go. Just the, the, the crunchy, clean kind of guitar sound played on that Fender Telecaster. Uh, the drums come and everything. It's just a really fucking brilliant jam. It's just freaking out. And if you've ever done Psychedelics and heard this album, you know you know how fucking awesome it is. You know how crazy this shit is. Um, personally, the mono mix of Interstellar Overdrive is so much better. For some reason, the stereo took out all the organs, which is, is a crazy weird decision in my opinion. Like, all the organ layering and guitar layering that they did on the original mono mix is so much fuller and better, so much more psychedelic. And if you're listening to this album, don't you want the most drug-induced music you can get? So I don't really get the reason for the removal of the um, layers. Maybe the stereo mix, they didn't have the tapes for them or something. But anyway, an 11-minute fucking awesome jam song from their live performance at this time. People say this was like their best shit, so I love it. Next following it is another cool little cute pop song written by Sid Barrett, The Gnome. Um, I really like this one. This one always has given me just a really cool vibe to it. Um, cool little acoustic chill intro. And after coming out of a crazy sh jam like Interstellar Overdrive, you're kind of taken back into reality a little bit. You kind of a normal little pop song and it's still psychedelic and weird, but back into kind of reality. Following it up is a song called Chapter 24, also written by Sid Barrett. This was inspired by some weird poetry, um, Asian poetry or something <coughs> that Sid Barrett was really into. I don't really know the whole backstory behind it, but the first lyric is a movement is accomplished in six stages and the seventh brings success, something like that. Really cool lyrics and I've always loved the song. This is always one of my favorites on the record. Cool harmonies and stuff. 
Following it is another short little cute folk song called The Scarecrow, which was the B-side to Arn or actually see Emily play. And I've always loved this one. This is like the most medieval sounding to me on the record. I, I imagine like Monty Python, the Holy Grail, um, or just going back to the fucking 1600s or something to a castle. Scarecrow reminds me of that. So cool little short song, nothing too much to it, but it's catchy, it works very well. And following it up is the last song of the album, Honestly, maybe my favorite on the entire album besides Astronomy Domine, Bike. Um, probably Sid Barrett's, I don't know if it's his crowning achievement, but probably the most Sid Barrett song he ever made. I've got a bike, you can ride it if you like. It's got a basket, a bell that rings, and things to make it look good. I'd give it to you if I could, but I borrowed it. You're the kind of girl that fits into my world. I'll give you anything, everything, if you want thing. Um, there's a lot of metaphors in the lyrics. Um, but personally, the way I kind of interpret it is when he's talking about, let's go into the other room and borrow it or whatever. And then you hear the, the, the huge fucking production at the end with the clocks and the crazy noise sound effects. I always thought bike was a metaphor for sex. It may not be, because that doesn't sound like Sid Barrett's jam. He doesn't seem like that kind of dude to write about sex. He seems like, bike kind of seems like an innocent song. But I don't know, I always just felt from like the push and pull of the instrumentation and the production and the metaphors and the lyrics, that's just kind of the impression I got from the song. But regard regardless of the meaning or lyrics, it's a brilliant, catchy, weird song with just some crazy time signatures, um, just great melodies. His voice works so well on it. And the chorus is just, you know, when it's like the bomb, bomb, I got a room of musical tunes, that shit's wild. Like, tell me something on a later Pink Floyd album that replicates that sound. I don't think they ever did that again. Just so out there and unique and original. And and one thing I have to say, this is by far my favorite produced Pink Floyd album. Stereo or mono mix. I mean, I definitely prefer the mono, but... It's so inventive and creative with the sound effects they use, with the dissonance, with the layering of the keyboards, the bass, the guitar, the drums. It's such like an open and reverby sounding album and you could definitely tell it was recorded pretty quickly but i think it adds to the rawness of it it gives it a um timeless kind of feel because it doesn't feel like it's trapped in the 70s of slick glossy production you just feel like it's a live band just fucking playing their hearts out and yeah norman smith who was the producer of it had a lot to do with the direction and sound of this album so credits to him for helping the band realize it because he said multiple times in the past that working with sid barrett on this album was a very difficult job sid was either out of it not paying attention what didn't show up didn't want to do something so he would kind of have to direct sid and help him and the band you know get together and record it because as i said during the recording of this album sid was doing a lot of drugs and kind of withdrawing himself from the band and yeah basically that recaps the whole album the piper at the gates of dawn um, in my personal opinion, if I had to give this a ranking out of 10, it's a 10 out of 10 fucking classic. Um, I mean, I don't think every song is on the same exact level of quality. Like, I definitely put Astronomy Domine, Looser for Sam, Matilda Mother, Interstellar Overdrive, and Bike ahead of, like, Take Up Thy Stethoscope and Walk. But just in terms of the sound they created, the aura they wanted to create, the atmosphere, and just the image of Pink Floyd, every song perfectly fits the mood they were going for. And to me, it's just such an exciting, fun, and enjoyable album that doesn't get boring. As much as I love an animal like the, or uh, as much as I love an album like The Wall, I can listen to that maybe once a year and never hear it again because it's amazing. It's beautiful. It does so much cool shit on it, but it's so labored over, drawn out. Um, you can tell a lot of the records from that time were such a you know one or two sided. Efforts where, you know, it was either like David Gilmore was more into this, Roger Waters was more into this. You could tell if Nick Mason and Richard Wright were into it, like The Wall, you could tell they weren't. You know, I definitely think with like Metal, um, Dark Side of the Moon, Wish, were you, Wish You Were Here, they were full great band efforts. But, you know, Pink Floyd fans watching, you know this. Their later works were, a lot of their later works, at least not all of them, but a lot of them were directly inspired by Sid Barrett and his tragic story. And... Um, you know, for those of you who know the story of when they were recording Shine On You Crazy Diamond, SYD, Sid came into the studio, they'd seen him for the first time in years, he looked nothing like he did here, and they said it was just a very sad sight, but what I find funny about that story particularly is that Sid walked in, they're like, what do you think, and he's like, sounds rather old, and you know what, Sid, I agree with you, I love Wish You Were Here, but that shit does not compare to this, 
This shit is inventive, one of a kind, visionary, brilliant, psychedelic, loud, wild, reckless, crazy, beautiful, varied. It's just everything I like about the Pink Floyd. So yeah, 10 out of 10 record. And if I'm going to talk about the singles as well, because I might as well just talk about all the other Sid Barrett songs that he composed during the time in the band, because personally, Sid Barrett's one of my idols, one of my absolute favorite musicians and artists of all time. Not just for the, the Pink Floyd stuff, but for his solo work with the Madcap Laughs, um, his self-titled Opal, and just the demos and shit. I love his stuff. I absolutely adore Sid Barrett and his work, his lyricism, his writing. His unique way of starting and stopping and pulling the tempo back, I think what he did better than anybody was just creating unique arrangements for his song. Well, not, not arrangements, but unique structures for his songs. Like, they didn't really ever follow the normal 4-4 standard pop song trope. I mean, some of them did, but, you know, in a song like See Emily Play, for example, when he included the tape loop, the crazy fucking sped up sound. You know, you never really had any other artists that do that. I mean, the Beatles kind of experimented with it, but I don't think any artist at the time took it as far out as Sid did. Um, just in terms of the never-been-done-before sound effect experimentation, you know? And I mean, a lot of that is help with of the producer, obviously, but he was the vision behind it. And I think, you know, Arnold Lane, Candy in the Current Bun, See Emily Play, and my personal favorite Pink Floyd song ever, their final single with Sid Barrett, Apples and Oranges, which was released later in 67. For you guys who haven't heard Apples and Oranges, which was backed by uh, Paint Box, which was a Richard Wright song, but Apple and Oranges, Apples and Oranges was the last single written by Sid Barrett for Pink Floyd. In my opinion, is the most psychedelic pop song they ever put out. Probably my favorite um, probably one of my favorite songs of all time. I'd probably put it in my top 10 favorite songs of all time. Um, so if you haven't heard Apples and Oranges, go listen to it. This shit's fucking awesome. They did a performance of it on the Dick Clark show, American Bandstand, in like 67. You could tell Sid's not into it. And, you know, I don't think they really liked the song too much because they felt the production was kind of rushed. Personally, I think that muddy, crazy production adds to the whole atmosphere. It's just fucking wild. The whole bridge... With, you know, the da, 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 with the sliding bass, the organ, the harmonies. Brilliant. So, my favorite Pink Floyd song is Apples and Oranges. And then Sid's final, I think, contribution to the band was on their next album, Saucer Full of Secrets, the last song, Jug Band Blues, which was a half acoustic, half, you know, kind of tuba, horn, crazy jam. Um, personally one of his best songs he ever wrote and a lot of people are like oh you know Sid wasn't aware of his his falling out with the band and you know he just lost his mind to drugs so you know you know that was his fault but I also do think he was very well aware of the situation if you listen to the lyrics in Jug Band Blues um you could hear that he was very well aware of him being distanced from the band he was aware that he was being cast out and they were moving on and in that sense it's a very very sad song or it's a, the last song of its era from him before he started doing his solo stuff and kind of the last song that showed Sid Barrett as the leader and visionary and genius of Pink Floyd but I guess instead of being sad that he left and the band didn't continue let's just be happy that we got the music we got and that Pink Floyd continued and made the rest of their amazing beautiful art because to me they're one of the absolute best of all bands of all time top five bands of all time easily the amount of influence they gave to music um from all their work, not just this one, but their later work as well. It's just so, it's so unique and distinct. And without Sid Barrett and this album, the Pink Floyd would have never gone anywhere. It wouldn't have happened. So thank you, Sid Barrett, for making your beautiful music, your beautiful singles, you know, just your beautiful art, all that shit, man. I mean, you're dead now. But for all the Sid Barrett fans watching this video, I think you can agree and understand why this dude is so revered, why he was such a unique and interesting guy, because... Like, let's say, Brian Wilson, my personal hero, he had such a childlike, innocent, naive essence to him, but it never came across as forced or an image. It's just who he was. And, you know, I'm kind of into the whole tragic rock figure thing, you know, Brian Wilson, Kurt Cobain, Sid Barrett, Lil Peep, people like that. And maybe that's for better or for worse, but I think pain and suffering, in a sense, can bring about deep art. 
And, you know, not saying that you need to feel pain to make deep art, but it can definitely contribute to that. And with Sid Barrett, story's no different. So, yeah, anyway, I've been rambling way too long. I appreciate you guys all watching. Um, go get yourself a mono copy of The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Check out Apples and Oranges, See Emily Play, Arnold Lane, um, Scream Thy Last Scream, The Vegetable Man, Jug Band Blues, Sid Barrett's solo shit. I mean, I mentioned a few songs like Everresting Elephant, uh, Wined and Dined, uh, Baby Lemonade, Dark Globe, um, No Good Trying. There's just so many brilliant, one-of-a-kind, unique songs that dude did, but I don't want to make this song long, or I don't want to make this video longer than the album itself, so I think that's pretty much all I have to say about it. Um, yeah, so The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, Pink Floyd's debut album, I'm going to give a 10 out of 10. Thank you guys for watching. Leave your thoughts on this record in the comments. What do you guys think about Sid Barrett? Do you prefer the Sid Barrett era? The later stuff? Do you prefer the middle era of like metal Adam Hart Mother? Just let me know your guys' thoughts on Pink Floyd and this album in general. And yeah, comment whatever you want. And I can't wait to see you guys in the next one. Thank you very much for watching. Have a great night. Peace out.